Okay, I'm here with my old and dear friend, Captain Sam Richardson. Sam and I lived in the same apartment complex when we were in flight school. I was going to Mainside, Pensacola. Sam was going north to Whiting. Sam became a Tomcat pilot. And during one hop, he actually entered a flat spin. And uh, I want to let him tell the story from there. So I was a student in uh, VF-124 going through learning how to fly the F-14. The last stage of training right before you carrier qualled was what was known air combat maneuvering. The F-14 had a single stick in the front seat. In the back seat, it was just a radar control. So it was a single piloted aircraft. And for the very first ACM flight, you would take the airplane out and it would, you would demonstrate and fly it to all the air, uh, edges of the envelope that the airplane had. And the way it was set up is you would have an instructor pilot in the front seat, the student pilot would be in the back seat, and the instructor pilot would go out and demonstrate each of the, the maneuvers that were in the, uh, in the syllabus. And then you were to come back, go through the octagon, get a full bag of gas, uh, swap seats, and now the student would be in the front seat with the instructor in the back seat, and you go do the exact same flight again. So you would have you know, briefed it, you would have observed it, and now you had the opportunity to actually fly it. And the instructor, if you were having problems, can talk you through it. So that was the basic setup for the ACM-1. And uh, it was on that flight that I was paired up with Lieutenant Nasty Manazer. He was uh, my pilot, my instructor. And um, we went out, we briefed the flight, manned up the jet. Beautiful day over San Diego and, and over the, the Pacific and went out to the operating area, which was about 50 miles, 70 miles uh, south of San Clemente Island. So we're over water, and we worked our way through the, uh, all the different maneuvers that we needed to uh, demonstrate. And uh, one of them what was known as the zero airspeed departure. And the way you set that up is you would start at, I think, 5,000 feet uh, over the water, and you'd be 500 knots and you would put the engines in mill power, military power, and then pull up, put the aircraft on its, you know, just straight up in the vertical, and you would fly as high as you could go before you ran at airspeed. When you ran at airspeed, then the airplane would just depart in one manner or the other, and then you would recover. So pretty benign maneuver. Uh, but in this case, we went out and, uh, and Nasty really wanted to, to get a, a good tail slide out of it. So he, he basically wanted to uh, set the nose right, right in the pure vertical. And then when you ran out of airspeed, he really wanted to fall straight back in a kind of a, a uh, you know, just a, a perfect knife edge type of uh, uh, position. So we get all set up and uh, it's 5,000 feet or, and uh, 500 knots. We military power, put it straight up. And as we get up to about maybe 25, 26,000 feet, run out of airspeed, the nose starts to fall forward, and then we have a, a very benign recovery. Um, so it wasn't really all that exciting, and, uh, and he wasn't you know, very happy that he couldn't get the, the uh, airplane to stand on his tail. Uh, but anyway, we completed the maneuver, completed the event, and as we were, uh, as we were finishing up, we had some more gas. And he said, uh, hey, Slammer, we, got, we have some more gas, so do you want to do anything else before we go back to base? And I said, well, yeah, why don't we go do that zero airspeed departure again? And he goes, okay, great. Well, this time I'm really gonna do it well. So same setup, we get down to 5,000 feet, 500 knots, uh, puts it in the pure vertical. We get up 25, 26,000 feet. And different than the first time, as we got to the pure vertical and ran out of airspeed, we had a compressor stall in the left motor. And so we had flames coming out of the, uh, out of the left side of the uh, intake. And as we fell, we fell now on our back and ended up into kind of a, an inverted position, spinning about a, about a turn and a half and somehow got into a, a, a right side up position. So we've got the, the, uh, the compressor stall noises in the, uh, in the headset and we've got the, the temperature of the TIT going, we got flashing lights. And, uh, and we're spinning and I have a flashing uh, spin arrow in the, uh, the TID. So it's, it's all of a sudden, okay, this did not 
happen as planned. And as we come back around and we're now right side and we've got a pretty good spin rate. And in the Tomcat, you would have a spin arrow and it would tell you the direction of spin. And if you got above 90 degrees a second, or it was right around there, maybe 100 degrees a second, instead of a steady spin arrow, you would have a flashing spin arrow. And so as this happens, we're talking to each other because we're on hot mic. And he says, I have a compressor stall, shutting down the motor. Uh, you know, this is what I've got in the front seat. I'm telling him what I'm seeing in the back seat. Okay, I've got a spinning, I get a, a, a spin arrow. Now it's a flashing spin arrow. So now we're, we're wrapped up pretty tight. The Tomcat had some uh, very uh, unique spin characteristics and it was, it was pretty directionally unstable, which is why you had two vertical uh, stabs. And you were taught very early in the, in the uh, syllabus that you needed to get onto your, your anti-spin uh, procedures very, very quickly because to get into a flat spin happened almost immediately and you were spring-loaded to prevent that from occurring. So as we go through this, he's reading off his, his uh, spin recovery procedures. I'm backing him up. He's going to stick forward, neutral ladder, lock harness, rotor opposite direction, turn. Okay, I've got a spin nail. And we're going through the procedures and we're reading them back and forth with each other. And now we've got a, a, a very high speed of, uh, of, uh, of rotation going. And I'm reading off altitudes and he's reading off instrument conditions and, and, uh, and we're basically uh, in a spin recovery, uh, full spin recovery mode. Now one thing about Nasty is he had just come back from the, um, uh, the centrifuge training and was the spin recovery SME for the rack. And so he was the most knowledgeable person about spin recovery procedures in the rag at the time. And so he immediately went into the alternate spin recovery uh, procedures and subsequently we found that they actually put us into a pro-spin situation rather than counter-spin, which we would have recovered from. In any event, we're in a spin. He's got the, uh, the controls uh, that we believe are required to get us out of the spin. And I'm reading off altitude. So the... The, uh, the procedures were, if you're in a spin, a confirmed spin, and you uh, reach 10,000 feet, you're supposed to eject. So from 25,000 feet down to 10,000 feet, we're talking back and forth, and we're going through the procedures and backing each other up, and I'm telling him what I have, altitude, spin direction, uh, spin rotation speed, and he's telling me what he's got as far as engine conditions, and, uh, and from the back seat, you could actually see a little bit better than the front seat. And the, the spin recovery indicator was that the nose would drop. And if the nose dropped, then there was a good likelihood that you could build up some airspeed, you get some wind over the vertical stabs, and you could stop that rate of uh, that rotation. So I'm back there, and we get down to about 10,000 feet. I call it off, but I also see the nose start to drop. I go, nose is dropping. He goes, roger that, stay with it. And we, st we, we stay with the airplane for about another you know, three or four rotations. And by now we're down to about 8,600 feet and, uh, and the nose has come back up to the horizon. So there was no way that we were gonna recover from that. And by now we'd lost both motors. They'd both bur uh, basically uh, over -tempt, and there was really nothing left to do. And so I go, nose is coming back up. He goes, Roger that, stand by for ejection. The first step in a uh, ejection sequence was for the Rio to uh, blow the canopy. And the reason was is you needed to get some separation from the canopy and the, uh, the ejection seats because as you're coming straight, dropping straight down, the canopy would sometimes basically hover right above you and there was an opportunity to hit that with the, uh, the ejection seat. So I pull the handle, it blows, we see that blow, and then I made the fatal error of lowering my head and uh, looking for the lower ejection handle between my legs. We were taught, and I didn't, uh, didn't follow through with what I was taught, but we were taught that when you're about ready to eject, you needed to get your back straight, put your chin up about 11 degrees, and either pull straight up with your lower ejection handle or your face curtain pull straight down, but you needed to have a vertical spine. And so I was in the position of dropping my head and looking for my lower handle when Nasty pulled the handle. And in the Tomcat, you always ejected the back person first, 
and as soon as he pulled his uh, handle, I went out. Well, actually, my seat went out. My head stayed still for a couple seconds or a couple nanoseconds, and basically snapped my head, and I was knocked out. So I didn't see anything, and uh, but obviously left the aircraft. And um, the first thing I know is once the parachute, once we had seat man separation. Then the, uh, then the parachute would go ahead and, and self-deploy, and at opening shock, it was a pretty good shocking uh, event, at that point it woke me up. So I wake up out of, a, out of a deep sleep with an opening shock, and I've got these straps on me, and I look out over the ocean, and I'm in my parachute. And the, the, first, the first reaction is grab my, grab my harnesses, <laughs> as if that was gonna help, and uh, and I look across and I see Nasty and he's in his parachute. And I look down, I see our airplane still spinning uh, with no canopy and no one in the cockpit. Kind of a surreal picture. But it's in a spin and, and it's heading down. And now I'm in my parachute. So you got a lot of time to think because we ejected around 8,000, 8,500 feet. And you drop at about 1,000 feet a minute. And so you've got about eight minutes. And so initially it's panic and then You've got time to kill, so you're looking around, you're looking at the horizon, you're, you know, getting a look at the uh, this, that, and the other thing, and you're going through your procedures. And so for, for us, once you eject, you have to go through the IROK. And the first thing you do is inflate your life preserver, then you uh, release your seat pan, and it's basically a little handle there. And when your seat pan opens up, that's where your life raft and other things are, and it's all uh, attached by straps and stuff. And it would basically fall down 30 feet or so, and then it would inflate. And so once you've done that, then you have, depending on how much time you have before you hit the, hit the water, you have options. So that's the O and IROK. And so you take off your gloves, you take off your, your mask maybe, uh, and if you have time and need to, you also have what's called a four-line release. And what you would do there is you would pull up and you would pull two um, shroud lines, which would basically free up a couple of the, uh, of the parachute. It would cut a couple lines and it would give you kind of an opportunity to have some forward momentum and you could actually start to steer the uh, parachute in a little bit. So as I'm going through all my IROK, I'm looking across at Nasty, and as I do, you know, one of these things, I see him, he's doing the same thing. Uh, he, I release, he releases, and then when we get to options, I start doing this, and then Nasty starts doing this. He does the four-line release, and he starts pulling left, <clears throat> and I'm on my parachute, and I start pulling left, and all of a sudden you get this closing rate. And initially it's kind of funny, but now all of a sudden we're closing, we're at the same altitude and both our parachutes are getting closer and closer. And I gotta tell you, the only time I was scared of in the entire event is when we were coming close to, uh, together and we had a good opportunity to hit each other in our parachutes, get tangled up and then die <laughs> by a tangled mess the last 5,000 feet to our death. And at that point, I'm pulling like a son of a bitch on one side, he's pulling and we have this pass. It is a level pass and he would say it's probably 30 feet between our parachutes. It was pretty close. It wasn't much more than that. Uh, and we see each other, our eyes are wide and we just go past each other. It's like, that's it, stay over there, nasty. And, uh, and then from that point on, it was pretty uneventful. We, uh, uh, came through the clouds. There was a cloud deck uh, that started at about uh, 2,000 feet, up to about 3,000 feet. So you couldn't see the water until until you went through that cloud deck. Uh, and once you got through that, then you saw the ocean. And now it was pretty close to uh, uh, getting ready for the water entry. And then once you hit the water, you release the coke fittings, and then the parachute is supposed to flow, uh, be blown away. One of the one of the fears you would have is if you didn't release the, the, uh, the cook fittings properly and the parachute were to fall on you, there was an opportunity for entanglement. And, uh, uh, and that happened with me. And so I ended up getting in the water and getting tangled up by all these shroud lines. And that is a problem because as the, as the parachute 
starts to get wet and get heavy and it starts to sink, it has an opportunity to pull you down with it. So very rapidly you, you kind of scull away and you kind of remove these, these, uh, these shroud lines. And I was finally successful and able to do that, uh, at which time I was able to climb into my raft and uh, look over and start paddling over to see Nasty. Well, one of the two, two new uh, unique things happened during that event. One is, as we were spinning the Rio, and that's the position I was playing, is supposed to do radio calls, a mayday call, and then um, and let notify everybody that you're in a spin and about to eject. I did none of that. I was just talking to Nasty, and uh, he talking to me, and I didn't make any radio calls. But there was an E2 that was out there flying in the same area, and they're just goofing around or doing training, and they see this Tomcat go up and then come down and start to spin and then watch the ejection. So the E2 started the search and rescue effort before we even hit the water. Uh, and then the second thing is there was a SAR uh, training event going on right in the area when we landed. So there were helos already out there, and I think from the time I hit the water to the time I'm in a, getting pulled up on the helicopter was 17 minutes. Lo and behold, I get pulled up uh, in one helicopter, Nancy gets pulled up in the other helicopter, and then we get uh, shepherded back to uh, safety down in uh, North Island. So there are a couple of investigations. One is you have a safety investigation, uh, and then you have a JAG investigation. And so in the safety, safety investigation, um, I got interviewed by uh, the, the, the board uh, lead was Jimmy MacArthur. He was a PXO for VF24, and, um, and he ran the safety board. And they asked me a series of questions, um, but the, the fact is I knew my procedures, I actually performed the procedures, and I was very confident in, in, in uh, describing what happened and, and my role in that. And my, uh, so I was cleared right away. And within, I think, two weeks, I was back to flying, and I finished with my class in that same uh, ACM uh, event, or that, that whole syllabus. Nasty had, uh, um, since he was the pilot in, in the controls, they looked at him in a much uh, harder manner, and and so they did. They did two. They did the safety board, and then they also did that mishap board. Um, and as it turned out, the the uh, the findings I believe were that, as I as I briefly described earlier, because the airplane wasn't in a fully developed spin, when Nasty put in the anti-spin controls, it turned into pro-spin controls. And we were actually what's called post-stall gyrations. The airplane was just flipping around. Uh, it was on its back. There were some other problems with it. But basically the airplane was in incipient, not even incipient, but it was in post-stall gyrations. And so by reacting as quickly as we were taught, taught to, to counter a spin, it ended up putting us into pro-spin, which developed into a self-sustaining spin fairly quickly. So the lesson learned there is, is really neutralize, analyze uh, before you end up you know, trying to uh, recover from a, from a spin. Uh, I had been water skiing about a month prior and had a really bad fall that really damaged my back and hurt it awfully badly um, to the point where you, know, you, you just had a hard time moving. And your biggest fear, other than, than looking bad in the break, was to go to the flight dock and possibly get grounded. So I never went to see a doctor. Um, and I didn't want to even, even go see a civilian doctor. But anyway, the, it, it was really, I'd hurt my back pretty hard. The morning of that flip-flop pop, my, the ejection, I'm driving from, from Del Mar down to uh, Miramar, uh, from my home down to the base, and my back is killing me. And as I'm driving down I-5, I'm thinking, boy, if I eject today, and I'm, I'm not making this up. I said, if I eject today, you know, I'm going to be a paraplegic. And right then I see this van pass me, and it's got a, a California disabled parking, you know, uh, a license plate. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, that's an omen. So now you fast forward. We've been picked up by the helicopters. We're now down at Medical in Coronado in Nasty is kind of his, he's hurting and he's hey, he goes, oh shoot slammer how you feeling and i hadn't thought about it until then but it's like 
Man, I feel great. I'm moving my back. No pain whatsoever. I don't know what happened, but there was, there was absolutely, <laughs> I had no problem with that at all. Years later, the, uh, I do have a bulged disc up uh, C5, C6. Uh, so I think there was some damage there, but at that moment, uh, I was feeling pretty good. Martin, thank Sam, thank you for recounting that harrowing day. Glad you made it. Glad you yep. followed Boldface. And uh, it's great to see you here. Hey, my pleasure. Nice to see you. All right. Okay. That'll do it for this episode. We'll talk to you guys again soon. Bye.